William Fife Noland, June 26, 1908 to February 23, 1974, was an American politician, newspaper publisher, and Republican Party leader. He was a U.S. Senator representing California from 1945 to 1959. He served as Senate Majority Leader from August 1953 to January 1955 after the death of Robert A. Taft. As the most powerful member of the Senate and with his strong interest in foreign policy, Noland helped set national foreign policy priorities and funding for the Cold War, the policy regarding Vietnam, Formosa, China, Korea and NATO, and other foreign policy objectives. He opposed sending American forces to French Indochina and was a sharp critic of Communist China under Mao Zedong. Noland represented the right wing of the party and considered some of President Dwight D. Eisenhower's policies too liberal. After the Republicans lost their majority in the 1954 election, he served as minority leader from 1955 to 1959. He was defeated in his 1958 run for California governor. He succeeded his father, Joseph R. Noland, as the editor-in-chief and publisher of the Oakland Tribune. Topic. Background Noland was born in the city of Alameda, Alameda County, California. His father, Joseph R. Noland, was serving his third term as a U.S. representative. He was the third child, with an older sister, Eleanor (1895–1978), and a brother, Joseph Russell Russ Noland Jr. (1901–1961). His grandfather Joseph Noland (1833–1912) had made the family fortune in the lumber business. His mother, Eleanor Fife Noland, died on July 20, 1908, less than a month after his birth. His father's second wife, Emmeline S. West, raised Noland as her own son. A young Noland made campaign speeches for the 1920 Republican ticket of Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge at the age of 12. He married at 19, became a California State Assemblyman at 25, entered the U.S. Senate at 37, and became a grandfather at 41. Topic. Early political career Noland, the president of the student body, graduated from Alameda High School in the class of 1925. He graduated with a political science degree in three and a half years from the University of California, Berkeley in 1929. He was a member of Zeta Psi fraternity. California Governor C.C. C. Young and University of California President William Wallace Campbell praised Noland's political activities as a university student. Noland attended the 1932 Republican National Convention. He watched from the gallery, the California delegation which included his father, Earl Warren, Louis B. Mayer and Marshall Hale. The Republicans in Chicago renominated President Herbert Hoover and Vice President Charles Curtis. In November 1932, he was elected to the State Assembly, serving two years, and in 1934 to the California State Senate, serving four years. He did not seek re-election in 1938 but remained very active in the California Republican Party by serving in a number of roles. He was also influential on the national scene, serving as the chairman of the Executive Committee of the Republican National Committee from 1940 to 1942. Noland campaigned for 1940 Republican presidential candidate Wendell L. Wilkie. Topic. World War II In June 1942, Noland was drafted into the U.S. Army for World War II service. After a few months' service as a private and sergeant, he went through officer candidate school and was commissioned as a second lieutenant. 
He served as an aide to Brigadier General M. L. Stockton, then attended military government school. He was sent to Europe in 1944, landed in France a month after D-Day, and served in various rear echelon duties, rising to the rank of Major. Topic. Awards Topic. U.S. Senator Hiram Johnson, the senior U.S. Senator from California, died on August 6, 1945. On August 14, 1945, Governor Earl Warren appointed Nolan to fill Johnson's seat. Warren first offered the Senate seat to Joseph R. Noland, who declined Warren's offer. I lost the Senate seat in 1914, I have the responsibility of the Oakland Tribune, bring my boy, Billy home. Major William F. Noland was serving on special duty with the Army Public Relations Section as part of the European Occupation Forces in Paris. Noland always said he learned of his new job from an article in Stars and Stripes. Noland's wife Helen tried to telephone him with the news, but she couldn't get past the military censors, who said it was not essential government business. Noland was sworn in as a freshman senator of the 79th Congress September 6, 1945, the day the Senate adjourned in memory of Hiram Johnson. He was assigned membership in the Commerce Committee, the Irrigation and Reclamation and Immigration Committee, and the National Defense Committee, formerly the Truman Committee. In 1946, in a special election for the last part of Johnson's term, Nolan defeated Democrat Will Rogers Jr. by 334,000 votes. The special election featured a blank ballot, whereby electors had to write in the name of their choice. He also defeated Rogers in the general election by nearly 261,000 votes, winning a full term in the Senate in his own right. Noland became a caustic critic of the Harry S. Truman administration. He was publicly critical of the actions in the loss of China to communism and the Korean War. However, Noland admired the former senator from Missouri personally. A firm believer in legislative authority under the U.S. Constitution, Senate leader Noland sometimes also was at odds with President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Eisenhower wrote that Noland means to be helpful and loyal, but he is cumbersome, and described the senator's foreign policy views, particularly on Red China, as simplistic. In his diaries, the publicly avuncular Eisenhower felt free to confide more critical assessments of his political acquaintances. Noland has no foreign policy, except to develop high blood pressure whenever he mentions Red China. In his case, there seems to be no final answer to the question, how stupid can you get? Fellow conservative Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater described Noland as a very determined man, and a very highly principled one, and as long as he and Eisenhower agreed on the legislation that Ike wanted, Bill would fight his head off for it. In 1954, for example, Noland voted in support of Eisenhower's initiatives 91% of the time. Noland sometimes was called the Senator from Formosa now known as Taiwan, for his strong support for Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalist government in China against Mao Zedong and the communists. A keen opponent of China's accession to the United Nations, Nolan tangled with Indian statesman V. K. Krishna Menon over the issue, leading the latter to acidly recommend psychiatric treatment to the former. In later years, Noland moderated his position, praising President Nixon's diplomatic overture to China in 1972. At the 1948 Republican National Convention, Noland made the nominating speech for Warren as the vice presidential candidate, and he was seen on the podium with presidential candidate Thomas E. Dewey. In the June 1952 primary election, Noland cross filed running for both the Republican and Democratic nominations. 
He got 2.5 million votes to 750,000 for his Democratic opponent, Clinton D. McKinnon, and won both nominations. In the general election, he was opposed only by an independent progressive. Quote, he won with 88% of the vote and carried 57 of the 58 counties. The 1952 Republican National Convention met in Chicago. General of the Army Eisenhower and U.S. Senator Robert A. Taft of Ohio were the two main candidates. On July 8, 1952, Taft asked Noland if he were interested in the vice presidency. Eisenhower won the nomination and selected as his running mate Richard M. Nixon, who was serving as California's junior U.S. Senator. On September 23, 1952, Nixon gave the Checkers speech, a response to allegations that Nixon had maintained a secret fund of political donations from business leaders. It was reported that Nolan said after the Checkers speech, I had to have my picture taken with that dirty bastard, crying on my shoulder. Eisenhower's aides contacted Noland and persuaded him to fly from Hawaii to join Eisenhower and be available as a potential replacement running mate. However, seeing public opinion, Eisenhower retained Nixon on the 1952 Republican ticket. When Taft died on July 31, 1953, Nolan was chosen to succeed him as Senate Republican leader, majority leader from 1953 to 1955, minority leader from 1955 to 1959. At age 44, he is the youngest senator to occupy the position of majority leader. The Republican majority during Nolan's stint as majority leader was tenuous. Taft's Senate seat was filled by a Democrat, which gave Democrats 48 seats compared to the Republicans' 47. One senator, Wayne Morse of Oregon, who dropped his Republican affiliation to become an independent, pledged to vote with the Republicans on organizing the Senate in 1954 and brought the Republican tally to 48 seats. The constitutional provision for the vice president to cast a tie-breaking vote gave Republicans a working majority to organize the Senate. Noland's Democratic counterpart was Lyndon B. Johnson of Texas. Noland and Johnson shared a cordial and respectful political relationship, often working in tandem on policy and procedure, including co-authoring a resolution in 1957 in an unsuccessful attempt to limit the filibuster, the practice of allowing minority viewpoints to use everlasting debate to obstruct the passage of legislation. To completely block the legislative process of government is too much power for any responsible person to want, and far too much power for any irresponsible person to have," Noland said of the filibuster. Noland and Johnson crafted and passed, in the Senate, the Watered-Down Civil Rights Act of 1957. It was the first such law since Reconstruction. After the bill was passed, Noland wept because of the bill's perceived weakness in protecting civil rights. Noland called the Senate the most exclusive club of 96. There were 48 states at the time. He was slow to criticize its most infamous member, Wisconsin's Republican junior Senator Joseph McCarthy. In 1953, McCarthy questioned the integrity and good faith of U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, which led Nolan to denounce McCarthy publicly. McCarthy was later condemned by the Senate for conduct contrary to Senate traditions. In his vehement investigation of alleged communist infiltration of the U.S. government, amid speculation that Eisenhower might not run for re-election, Noland briefly floated his candidacy for president in 1956, but he withdrew when Eisenhower decided to seek a second term. Noland was temporary chairman of the 1956 Republican National Convention in the San Francisco Cow Palace. On appointing Noland as delegate to the 11th General Assembly of the United Nations in 1956, Eisenhower wrote, Noland brings to his leadership post an absolute, unflinching integrity that rises above politics. In the councils of government, he inspires faith in his motives and gives weight to his words. 
Noland had a long-running battle with Nixon, with whom he served in the Senate from 1951 to 1953, for influence in California Republican Party affairs. Nonetheless, he gave Nixon the constitutional oath for Vice President of the United States January 20, 1953 and January 21, 1957 on the east portico of the U.S. Capitol. In 1968, as Nixon came across the Bay Bridge from San Francisco to Oakland, when an aide pointed out the Oakland Tribune Tower, Nixon replied, Bastard. Topic. Campaign for governor In 1958, Noland decided to run for governor of California instead of re-election to the Senate. His father was shaken by the decision, as he cherished the Senate seat, voters had denied him California's other Senate seat in 1914. Nolan secured the Republican nomination for governor after a brutal contest with incumbent Goodwin J. Knight. In the Big Switch, Knight agreed to run for Nolan's U.S. Senate seat while Nolan ran for governor. Many felt Nolan would use the governorship to control the California Republican delegation in 1960 and to try to deny Nixon the presidential nomination but get it himself. A critical issue in the campaign was Proposition 18, an initiative to enact a right-to-work law in California. Noland endorsed Proposition 18 in excessive language, but Proposition 18 was highly unpopular, and the endorsement hurt Noland. He was soundly defeated in the general election by the Democratic candidate, California Attorney General Edmund G. Brown by a 59% to 40% margin. After dominating California politics for over half a century, many other California Republicans were also defeated for statewide offices, including Knight. Following the election, Nolan's political career was effectively over. Among Joseph R. Nolan's protégés, Representative John J. Allen Jr. lost his House seat to Jeffrey Kohalan, and Alameda County Supervisor Kent D. Purcell lost his race for the state Senate to John W. Holmdahl. To pay off some of Nolan's campaign debts, his father had to sell his Oakland Tribune radio station KLX to Crowell Collier Broadcasting. Nolan never again ran for any elective office. Topic. After politics The 1964 Republican National Convention, again in San Francisco's Cow Palace, nominated Barry Goldwater for president. Noland backed the Goldwater-Miller ticket and spoke for the Arizona senator across the country. Noland was the titular head of the California Republican Party from 1959 to 1967, when he passed the party leadership to the new governor, Ronald Reagan. In the 1966 California gubernatorial campaign, Reagan ran on a law and order message, while Noland and his old California Republican rival Richard Nixon worked tirelessly behind the scenes, enabling Reagan to win two-thirds of the primary vote over George Christopher, the moderate Republican former mayor of San Francisco. The momentum from Reagan's successful primary win carried over to the general election, where he defeated incumbent Democratic Governor Pat Brown in a landslide. Russ, Noland's brother, died on October 6, 1961. Noland became the sole successor to his father and to control of the Oakland Tribune. Noland became president, editor, and publisher of the Oakland Tribune in 1966, after the death of his father. Noland was typically called Senator by the staff after his return to the paper from Washington. He kept the editorial pages of the Tribune solidly Republican. However, he took steps to add a bipartisan bent to the news pages, including the appointment in 1969 of a political editor with Democratic Party leanings. His son, Joseph W. Noland, was assistant publisher with the position of assistant general manager. 
In a cost-cutting move that ultimately hurt the Oakland Tribune, the Southern Alameda County and Contra Costa County additions were trimmed. That opened the areas to Floyd Sparks 1900-1988, the owner of the Hayward Daily Review, and Dean Lesher 1902-1993, owner since 1947 of the Contra Costa Times. In early 1968, Oakland Tribune circulation rose because the major San Francisco newspapers were on strike. When the San Francisco Chronicle and San Francisco Examiner returned, Tribune sales fell in home delivery and on the street sales. As editor and publisher, Nolan took an interest in local affairs along with the job and was less concerned with national and foreign policy. During his tenure as newspaper executive, Oakland and the East Bay Area were changing, with the free speech movement at UC Berkeley, the Black Panthers, and white flight to the suburbs. He offered a $100,000 reward for the conviction of those responsible for the 1973 murder of Marcus Foster. The Symbionese Liberation Army SLA, claimed responsibility. The SLA subsequently kidnapped Patricia Hearst and Atlanta Constitution editor J. Reginald Murphy. Such acts made Noland fearful for his own safety. The Tribune turned 100 years old on February 21, 1974. Nolan spoke on the occasion. For 100 years this newspaper has participated in the growth of Alameda and Contra Costa counties. Now as we look into the future it becomes ever more important that newspapers here and in other cities keep the public adequately informed. He went to all departments on that Thursday. At the banquet at Goodman's Hall, Governor Ronald Reagan praised the Tribune and the Nolan family. The Oakland Tribune was sold in 1977 by the Nolan family. After four ownership changes, it is now a daily newspaper of the Bay Area News Group, Bang, a subsidiary of Media News Group. Topic. Personal life William F. Noland was married to Helen Davis Herrick, whom he had met in the sixth grade. They were married on New Year's Eve in 1926. They were divorced on March 15, 1972, citing irreconcilable differences, a quiet reference to his affairs. Noland then married Ann Dixon on April 29, 1972, but the two were estranged by the end of that year. He and Herrick had three children, Emmeline K. Jewett, Joseph William Noland, and Estelle Noland. He had two stepchildren, Kay and Steve Sessinghouse, from his marriage to Dixon. He was known as Big Da, to his family, so named by his first grandchild, Emmeline Grace Jewett. Topic. Suicide On February 23, 1974, Noland died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound, an apparent suicide, at his summer home near Guerneville, California. His personal life had dismantled around him. Heavy gambling took all his money and more. He died owing over $900,000 to banks and impatient mobsters. Topic. Remains At the main mausoleum of the Mountain View Cemetery, in Oakland, California on Floor I, M8, J, N, 2, T, I, Noland is with his first wife, Helen Noland White 1907-1981 and her mother, Estelle Davis Herrick, 1881-1963. Also contained are the remains of Ruth Lamb Caldwell Narfee, 1909 to 2003, and her first husband, Hubert A. Caldwell, 1907 to 1972, and second husband, Gaetano Tani Narfee, 1905 to 1996. 
at the Chapel of Memories in Oakland, California, two tiers down from his father, Joseph R. Noland in the Serenity Section Tier 4 No. 6, a double book urn has only one side inscribed, U.S. Senator William F. Noland, 1908-1974.